Uh, good morning, Real Life. I'm glad to be here with you guys. My name is uh, Josh Gray. I get the privilege of s- serving here at the, as the lead servant of an amazing group of people that go out and reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. Yeah, and many of you are out making disciples of Jesus and teaching people of Jesus' ways, teaching them what his heart looks like and how to be loved, how to receive love. And so I'm really proud to be part of a church like this. I want to welcome all of those joining us online. Thank you for being part of our family as well. Uh, may God's hand be just upon you and, and wherever you are and, and as you watch. I don't know why there's so much energy after serving when my body is so tired, but the rest of me is like, woo! I got to cut down a tree yesterday. I got to rip out a bush with, with my Ford F-150 that actually did it. Some people are like, that's the miracle. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was pretty fun. You know, we got to do some great things. So I, I group, uh, our life group and some other folks got to serve at uh, Plus Cares in, in Moscow. We made that place beautiful on the outside the best we could. And they make people beautiful on the inside by telling them about what it looks like to, to choose life. And so super uh, honored and excited to, to do that. I don't know why it is. There's so much energy through service. It's almost like God said it is, you know, it is better to give than it is to receive. And so we got to give and the only thing that bothers me about Surf Fest is that it's an event. I love it when it's a lifestyle. Like, there's still projects. Somebody came up to me today. They're like, I wish our whole church was at our project because we didn't get it all finished. We did a lot, but we could have done a whole bunch more. And I'm like, hey, you don't have to wait. We don't even have to wait till next year to do that. You could, I could, we could be like God's servants many, many times. And it's okay to serve outside of our body, and it's okay to serve people inside of our body. One of our uh, elders uh, had some health issues uh, due to a motorcycle that bucked him off, and um, he, uh, his group was at his house, and they dialed him up. They took care of his place, and he couldn't do things, and they took care of him, and that's serving. And so God's people taking care of God's people is pretty awesome. God's people taking care of his beautiful creation, that's pretty wonderful. And so I'm just excited to be part of a church that does that. Uh, so today we're going to continue on in our uh, little book series. Uh, we're going to look at Haggai. So this is the second smallest book in the New Testament. Um, it's uh, two chapters, 1,130 words. It was like almost twice as long as the book I read last week. <laughs> Lots of work in this. And so as I was going through Haggai, I really struggled. My Thursday sermon club rep was not the greatest one ever. And I was like, Lord, what do you want for your people? And that's what I asked. What do you want for your people out of this? What do you want us to learn about? how you were then and the people there then, and what do you want to learn, us to learn uh, to do with this knowledge? So again, it's a great question to ask as you approach God's word. God, what do you want me to know? Say that. What do you want me to know? And what do you want me to do? What do you want me to know? Okay, we got to, this is, not, okay. This section is the what do you want me to know section right here. This section is the what you want me to do. Now you're the smaller section, so you're going to have to be louder. All right, God. So I read. I get God's word. And I'm looking at him. I say, God, what? What do you want me to know? Reveal something to me, Father, about your beautiful word. Cool. I got more knowledge. Let's go get some more knowledge next time and just do nothing with what we got. Now, what do you want me to know? And do good. And so that's how I'm trying to approach the text. God, what do you want me to know about your word? And what do you want me to do with this great knowledge that you gave me? So this uh, book is uh, from an Old Testament prophet. Now, a prophet is uh, like an interpreter or foreteller of God's will. Prophets, uh, the cool thing about these three prophets at the end here, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, uh, they're titled, I love this title, different people look at the, these three guys and I was like, these are the prophets of restoration. These are the prophets that are trying to restore God's kingdom as the way that it should be through the trials and tribulations that they've gone through. And guess what I would say that you and I are? I don't know that we're prophets, but we are a kingdom of priests, and our job is to partner with God in restoring his beautiful creation back to how it's supposed to be. And it starts with allowing our hearts to be changed and to be restored. Anybody have some restoration that needs to happen within your own life, within your own heart? with those that are around you? Anybody see chaos around them? Right? So we start this restoration process, this rebuilding process, this restoring process starts right here. And how we think and how we act and how we function and what we take in, and it actually moves into our hearts. And then yesterday it went out in our hands and we did stuff. 
So prophets uh, also had two different roles, teaching roles and uh, revelatory roles, declaring God's truth on certain issues and also revealing details about the future. How many people ever heard the phrase, if you don't know your history, you are condemned to repeat it? And so for some reason, every generation thinks that they're immune from that. Well, that's their problem. Like, and as soon as you start thinking you're immune from, uh, from repeating the history that was before you, you're already repeating it because that's what they thought too. And so as you think about this uh, text today, as we look at this, I want you to keep that in mind. It's like, okay, is there something in here that's historical that we might want to catch ourselves on and see if we're repeating that? Now, you can't talk about Haggai without understanding temple. I got the privilege to study in Israel last May, and I was over there, and we went to the Western Wall. We actually went on the Temple Mount, which was really interesting, and the whole history of the Temple Mount, and there's like all these guards and people with guns and looking at you weird and stuff, but you got to go up there. They let us go up there. But this, uh, this temple idea of temple and what this is is really important for you to understand why it's a big deal in Haggai. So I got to sit in this one room, and they give you these 3D goggles, and you like get this tour through the temple, and it was amazing. <clears throat> You're like... This is much larger than I had imagined. I was wowed by the architecture. I was wowed by the size of things and what was going on. You could just look around in the temple. And you're like, and I'm sure everybody's looking at people with these goggles on. And we're just like looking all over the place. But temple is a big deal. So what's the big deal with the temple in, in the time of Israel, the Israelites? This is the dwelling place of God. The divine presence was important to the ancient Israelites. This is where God dwelled. So us as new believers, as Christians who accept Jesus Christ in our, as our Lord and Savior, guess where God dwells now? Directly inside you. You are the temple. There's all kinds of texts talking about how you are the temple of God. God has chosen to dwell in each one of us. Does that make sense? So when we talk about like we are the church, like we take the church with us. When we do things like we did yesterday or like you do in your life and you're serving other people, they're like, oh, that's what a Christian looks like. And when you're dumb and do something foolish, they're like, I guess that's what a Christian looks like. And so the temple resides in us. But prior in this time, the, the, you have to go to this place to get near the presence of God. And so the Lord's presence was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And he, provi he provided uh, instructions uh, for how it was to be built in Jerusalem. And the Lord gave King David instructions for the first temple. And it was to be intricate and beautiful beyond words and treasured, just like God. Can you believe that that resides in you? That you are to be someone who stewards God's presence, this beautiful, intricate presence with inside of every human being that accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that brings them in there, you're like, okay. Like, Lord, the temple's getting a little old and wrinkly. It's got some mileage on it. He's like, yeah, yeah, okay, I got you. I got something different for you later. This temple was so cool. When you go to Israel, they still can't figure it out. So just to give you the size and scope of, of the temple, uh, one of the blocks that they are looking at that they think might be the biggest block and this is all one piece of stone that they could tell. Think about this, you construction folks. It's 44 feet long. And it's 15 feet wide. And it's 11 feet tall. That was about nine and a half. Nine. It's like giant. And you would have a tough time fitting a credit card in between the cracks. No cement. Uh, like some of our guys are like, I don't really know how you'd move that. Like... I don't know, like there's some cool techniques that we'll learn, but like there's not a bunch of stuff around here that's going to move that. 570 tons. So let's take a look at what they think maybe the first temple might have looked like. A rendering and a drawing of, of the first temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So during the first temple period, it was built about 1,000-ish B.C. by King Solomon after King David conquered Jerusalem and made it his capital. And they're like, this is the dwelling place of God. And the Holy of Holies is in there. And there's all these great, if you want to do a full exhaustive research on temple, you'll have a good time with it. It's fun. But there's different pieces within the temple and the Holy of Holies. And you hear about when, 
when uh, Jesus uh, gave up his spirit, the, the veil of the temple was torn in two. This four foot or four, a 60 foot tall, four inch thick curtain just, you know, ripped in half from the top to the bottom. So this first temple was awesome and it was destroyed in 586 BC by Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians came and conquered Israel and all those things. And they destroyed this temple, this beautiful, intricate work of art. And not only was it destroyed, uh, the Jews were dispersed. So it'd be like, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but it'd be like if someone came and destroyed uh, Moscow and some of us made it through and we lived and then they sent us to a far off land like Seattle or something, I don't know. And we were gone for, a, for over 40 years. We were gone. And the place where we thought that God, where we knew that God dwelled, we didn't have it anymore. We would be heartbroken. And so the idea of what happens in the temple and being without that, and then what, what happened next was um, in uh, 538 BC, and we'll take a look at a picture of the second temple, King Cyrus made a decree. He had uh, defeated the Babylonians. He made a decree that the Jewish temple to be rebuilt and that you could actually come back to Moscow. Excuse me, Jerusalem. You could come back. And this is a model of what the temple uh, looked like. Uh, and this is in uh, Jerusalem. They have a whole model of the entire area. It's super cool. You, you, you walk around it. It's bigger than this room. All the houses, everything you could see, that it's the second, uh, second, uh, or the second temple, and you can walk around and see everything. And this thing uh, ended up being stellar, and it's awesome. And this was also a temple that was destroyed um, in 70 AD by the, by the Romans after that. They, they destroyed the temple. I think my dates might be wrong, but this temple was destroyed. So let's look at the temple today. So this is the Temple Mount. There's uh, roughly 40,000 uh, Muslims. The Muslims have control over this Temple Mount. Isn't that weird? Can you imagine... You're like, I want to go see the Lincoln Memorial. Got to check with the Russians. And then maybe you can get in there, but they're going to be watching you like a hawk with their guns. Like this happens in Jerusalem today. It's, it's the high holy site claimed by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. So about 40,000 people can fit on the Temple Mount. Uh, now they do 80,000 when it's really packed for uh, some sort of a Muslim festival. It's huge. It's like... I can't remember, 30, 40 football fields in size. It's giant. Um, and so this is what the temple looks like today. That's the Dome of the Rock, but that's, that's where these buildings that you just saw, they think they were. So do we understand temple a little bit more? Why it would be important to the, Jew, to the Israelites? And this is an important thing for them to do. So let's t go into the story in Haggai and take a quick look at uh, what this looks like. So Haggai, in your Bible, it's gonna be right near the Newer Testament. So there's only a book or two separating it. And so you're gonna be a little deep in this. And again, it's two chapters, 1130 words. And uh, let's take a look at what Haggai is about. So this is what the Lord says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. That's the temple. So these people are what? These people are the Israelites that have returned. These people are the, the rulers at that time, but uh, the king's already said it's okay to do this. King Cyrus said it's okay to do this, but these people are like, ah, it's not time. Okay, must, they must know. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. What's a prophet? Someone who hears from God and is a messenger of God, right? And is gonna, and is gonna talk about that. And he says, it is time. For you yourselves, or is, is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while, the, uh, while this house, the temple, remains in ruins? Paneled houses, this is like HGTV central, right? So the place where God dwells is not being taken care of. It's not moving forward at all. People got distracted and they're like, this granite countertop will never do. You know, I must have paneled, like paneled houses would be, you'd be super wealthy to have panel houses. Like, this is special. Like, you're doing all this stuff for you and making, building your kingdom, but God's house is over here laying in ruins. Like, God is not, you know, accessible in a sense. It's over here because you're too busy working on you. Totally can't even relate to it in America. And remember, God's house for us is in here. 
God's house is for us out here with our hands and feet, loving and serving and taking care of other people. That doesn't mean you can't have nice things. It doesn't mean you can't have beautiful countertops and all those other things. But where is God in this priority? That's the way I read it. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. And this was reflective for me this week. Give careful thought to your ways. So like your ways would be your, your, uh, your path. They would, they would ask you like, hey, how's your walk? How's your path? And they don't mean like your path to your house. They mean your spiritual path, your path in connection with God and who he is. How are, how, how are your ways? How's your path going right now? Where, where is this path that you're investing time, energy, and effort and treasure into? Is it leading you towards this rich relationship with God or is this leading you towards this rich relationship with taking care of your house? Give careful thought to your ways. And then he said, Josh, but probably didn't say it to you. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. I think he's saying you've lost your way. These people have lost their way. God is not a priority. And it is evident in where they're putting their time. It is evident in where they're putting their talents. And it's evident in where they're putting their treasure. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I might take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expect much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains in ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. So without God in the center of, of my life or your life, without him having a high place of priority should be first. Without careful consideration of your ways and how you're going to live, then what? What position does God have in your life? Would this be a message that would ever resonate to you if you were just reading this? If this was, if this was written to you, if there was a prophet that came to, to you and talked to you about, hey, consider your ways, what would you be considering? It goes on to say, therefore, and anytime we see a therefore, we have to ask, what's it? Therefore. Hey, good job, Kelsey. I love that. You see a therefore, you're like, what's it there for? Therefore, because of those things, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, and on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else on the ground that the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. It's like when you're not walking in God's blessing and you're trying to do it your own way, it seems like it's much more difficult. It's almost like it was said that we would toil in the earth as we separated ourselves from God in Genesis. It's almost like that because we choose to separate our, our God and we do it our way, we're just, man, this is so much harder. Versus being submitted, which is a difficult thing for us to do, is to submit our will, to submit our purpose, submit our plans to God's plans and put him first. So I started thinking this week, what are the things that causes me to not put God first? Your pastor. One of the things that causes me to, to not put God first is people pleasing. There's a lot of people to please. And I think about like, well, what will they think of me? I sometimes I'll try and spin it out and justify it. Like, well, what do they think of the church? And I worry so much about those image things instead of worrying about what will they think of my Lord? What will they think of my Savior? What will they think of my King Jesus? That's what I should be concerned about. And people pleasing doesn't always lead to that for me. 
Another thing that I struggle with is, is, is probably something maybe you, some of you struggle with is the idea that you have to find the path of least resistance. I think I live in a culture and I am uh, involved in that where I'm trying to make everything easy. I'm trying to make everything easy for my kids. Not really, they wouldn't say that. I'm trying to make everything, how easy can I make it on, on us or on the church or on all those things? And I don't know that easy's really produced a lot of great things. Do some hard things. Sometimes getting soft and weak, not just physically, but in my spirit. I get lazy in the hard things. That's probably something that, that, that keeps me off of God's path. Sometimes I get paralyzed in fear and knowledge. Like, well, I don't know enough. I can't do this because I don't have all the information correct. You know when I'll have all of the information correct? When I am in the arms of Jesus <laughs> and, 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 I, and I am with him, that's when I'll have it all figured out. I've actually said some stuff from the stage that's probably not accurate today maybe. Now, I'm not trying to. Please correct me. And, and, but like, you're not going to have it all figured out. If you're the type of person that has to have everything perfect before you do anything, you're never going to do anything. Sometimes you got to take some swings. The Christian walk is a journey for me. I started it in 1995, and I've fallen off the path several times, and I've had people in my life, I've had accountability, I've had people that have grabbed me and said, Josh, this is where that path leads. How do you feel about that? And I actually listened to them. They built enough relational capital in my life and cared enough in my life to actually come into my life and say, like, no, no, no. I don't think you want to go there. I can't stop you because you're, you're big and stubborn. But I think that the Lord is, is, is going to, you're not going to love where that leads. Who do you have in your life that's like that? That can speak deeply into your life, can tell you the hard things, and you'll take it. You see, the most important thing about me is how I view God. And that dictates how I live in this world. So I asked some questions for you. What are some of your current distractions from the path that God's supposed to, you're supposed to be on? What are you holding on to? What hurt are you just holding on to? And you, you hate it, but you kind of love it. You hold it as a baby. And you won't let that hurt go, go, and you'll let it hold you back from doing the things, the very things that God has called you to do because, well, I, I might get hurt again. You are going to get hurt again. And you have a, a, a Savior who heals. You have a Savior who heals you. Accept it, receive it, and keep moving forward. Like, if Jesus stopped doing everything when it got uncomfortable and he got hurt, what do you think would have happened? We wouldn't be talking about him. But to push through and be a church that does hard things, not but like you and me. Where's the sense of urgency? I think God is saying that here. Like, hey, you're building your stuff. And like, what about all these people that don't get to enter in the presence of God? And you're doing, where's your sense of urgency? And that's what I asked myself this week. Here's what I figured out. Most of us have 28,105 days to live. That's like 77-ish years. That's 674,520 hours. You just burned one here. Invested. I've already burned up 420,000 of my 674,000 hours. I'm proud of some things that I've done and not proud of others. But how am I going to make these next couple hundred thousand hours the most honoring to God, my Savior? How are you going to make the hours that you have left? What are you going to wish you would have done? Who are you going to wish you would have talked to? Nobody's probably going to build statues of most of us here. We might not be remembered in a couple hundred years, but the people that you touched through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that legacy lives forever. I should have a sense of urgency. Let's jam through a little bit of uh, Haggai chapter 2 here. I'll, I'll summarize some of this for you, but Haggai chapter 2, 3 through 5. So you get this like, let's go. Like, stop, stop doing your stuff and, like, get on the path of the Lord and, like, let's represent the Lord well. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have nice things or we don't have nice houses or any of those things. But, like, where is that in the priority list? And so 
The next part of this, as we're seeing, let's, let's dive into Haggai chapter 2. It says, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory, temple number one? How does it look to you now? We are not doing a good job. Does it not seem to you like nothing? They're like kind of piddling with it, like playing with your, playing with your relationship with God. My hobby level commitment in my religion. And when I'm done with this hobby, I'll move on to another religion slash church. When I'm done with this one, I'll move on over here and I'll just keep transitioning through and moving on away and playing with my hobby level commitment with God. There's what he says. But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. So Zerubbabel was like the governor of the area. Uh, Joshua would be like the high priest, like the, the head dude. He has told him to be strong. Be strong, all you people of the land on the Palouse, declares the Lord, and work. You got to work. Good work. Good things that are happening. Things that you're going to be proud of, that you're going to be so excited that you spent those hours investing in. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. So the prophet comes down, gives a little spanking, right? And then God's just like, let's go. He's not a God of just like spank you and you're bad and horrible and go in a corner and be crying about yourself. No, let's go. Let's do something. Let's engage. Let's make a difference. Let's go. I, I believe in you. And they kind of go through this thing where they're like, hey, what about this sacrifice? And they're like, no. And there's this like kind of this cheers like, no, we're not going to do this. It's kind of this rallying cry. And then in verse 6, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, not on your slide, but it's okay. It's in your Bibles. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake the nations. And what, and, and what is desired by all nations will come. I will fill this house with the glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Do you know where he did that? Right here, through his sacrifice, Jesus Christ on the cross, he created this house and he put that house inside of you. And he says, it's going to be awesome. Like he basically just said you were awesome. He just said that like you're going to make like cool, cool construction, but I'm going to put this inside of you. And you're going to go out and change the world. Then he goes on and he talks about blessings and, uh, and then he does another careful thought. And he says, uh, now, get, now give careful thought, this is verse 15, to this from the, this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was, lay, one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. From this day on, I will bless you. And on that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant, Zerubbabel, son of uh, Shehadiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. God chose you. He chose them, and he's chosen you. He's chosen even more. He's chosen to dwell within you. So what kind of people will they be? And, and more importantly, what kind of people will we be? The kinds that build our own kingdom first or the kind that will engage and build an eternal kingdom? How do you put God first in your life? You live a life of service. You live a life of mercy and grace to others, just as you and I have received that same mercy and grace from King Jesus. Amen? Amen. Have you received mercy and grace from King Jesus? Do you know that after this service, we're at people are going to get, some people are going to get baptized? And, yeah, amen. And after the next service, you know what? We got some people that are going to get baptized. And you may have walked in here today, and you're kind of playing with your faith thing, and you're not really sure, and like, well, what is this baptism thing? And we'd have a video, and that's all great and wonderful. But if you accept Jesus with, as your Lord and Savior, and you believe that he died on the cross, and you believe that he rose again, 
after the third day, then you will be saved. And then he has other instructions. Go and be baptized, immerse yourself, be born new, come up out of this water and be born new and declare to the world that you are his. Now, maybe you didn't bring a towel today. Maybe you got some really cool clothes on. You can take your shoes off, but it doesn't matter. Today might be your day and you didn't even know it and you're here. And if that's you, you can hang out after the service. I'll, we'll talk to you and we will baptize you today if that's you. Today, in front of God's people. But you got to get on the path. Get on the path in community. Get on the path in accountability. And get on the path of being real. Living like a real life. See what I did there? With other people. Your brokenness is okay here. The junk that you're carrying around is okay. You found the right place and the right people. And I know a guy that can help you with that junk. I know a guy that can, he actually starts on the inside and cleans that out first. And for some reason, it just overflows out of your body and out of your life and who you are because you can't help it. His grace, his mercy flows over all of us. Amen? All right, finishing off. Last thing. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. Paul is talking to this church and he says, we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and you are God's building. You are the temple, amen? His way is better. His way was so much better and God believed in it so much that he sacrificed his one and only son so we could be part of his way.